Anyone who is fully vaccinated can participate in indoor and outdoor activities, large or small, without wearing a mask or physical distancing. If you are fully vaccinated, you can start doing the things that you had stopped doing because of the pandemic. We have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. A major sign America may be turning the corner in this pandemic. Fully vaccinated Americans can ditch masks in nearly all places. President Biden tonight calling it a great day for America, praising Americans for stepping up to the plate and getting vaccinated. But what does the decision mean for communities across the country? And when is a mask still necessary? Are there specific situations like a supermarket, crowded bar, or coffee shop that you personally plan on still wearing a mask? You know, I, I don't think so. The true buildup tonight in Israel as there are more explosions on both sides. And now confirmation tonight, Israeli troops are in Gaza. And a possible new front line of the battle emerges. Rockets fired from Lebanon now toward Israel as well. Our Matt Gutman is on the ground for us once again. Squeezing into this uh, bomb shelter right now. And the rush for gas. Many stations running dry again tonight, but that half pipeline has now been restarted. When will it be back to normal? And when will gas stations in more than 10 states have enough fuel again? And the new report tonight about that pipeline company. Did it pay ransom to a Russian-linked hacker group? And is that big pipeline hack a wake-up call to end our reliance on fossil fuels and go green? It may not be that simple. Our Ginger Z explains in this week's It's Not Too Late. As we get closer to normal, what about the essential appointments that you've been putting off for a year or more? What do you need to know before trying to get back to places like the DMV again? It's been a challenging year of isolation for all of us, but imagine being a Holocaust survivor. Our Kier Phillips with the incredible life lessons tonight from two people who exemplify resilience. Freedom is a very, uh, very special thing that you can only understand and appreciate when you didn't have it. I know how difficult life is. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. 405 days ago, the CDC first recommended Americans start wearing a mask. For many Americans, it has been quite a year of challenge and, in many cases, resilience. And we witnessed that emotion mostly through people's eyes, as the rest of our faces and perhaps our emotions were often masked. But tonight, a major step back toward the old normal that might make some smile against smiles that we can actually see. This afternoon, the CDC announced that it is relaxing masking guidelines for fully vaccinated Americans in almost all settings. President Biden calling it a great day for America and urging Americans to get vaccinated or wear a mask until you do. The decisions will carry significant implications for businesses and schools, and it will be up to states and cities to decide when to ease masking restrictions. Whit Johnson leads us off tonight. Tonight, a giant step closer to normal life for millions of Americans. President Biden late today in the Rose Garden. It's a great milestone, a great day. It's been made possible by the extraordinary success we've had in vaccinating so many Americans so quickly. The president pointing to 250 million shots in 114 days. Fully vaccinated people are at a very, very low risk of getting COVID-19. Therefore, if you've been fully vaccinated, you no longer need to wear a mask. But Biden then cautioned this. If you're getting a two-shot vaccine and you've not gotten your, you only had your first shot, but not your second, or you haven't waited the full two weeks after your second shot, you still need to wear a mask. It came just hours after the CDC director revealed new guidelines on masks in this country, under growing pressure to do so. We have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. Today, Dr. Walensky said this new guidance is based on the science. More science that have, has emerged just in the last week. One is the effectiveness of the vaccines in general in real world populations. One is the effectiveness against variants, which was just published last week. And then the um, effectiveness in preventing transmissibility. There are some exceptions. Masks still required for those who are vaccinated on buses, trains, planes, and in hospitals. Americans reacting to the news. 
I've already planned a mask burning party. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um, I think that's what everyone was waiting to hear. But some wanting the country to move more slowly. I think we should continue for a while until more Americans have been vaccinated. Tonight, the CDC is now working to update guidelines for schools, camps and businesses. Starting today, millions of teens, 12 to 15 years old across the country, were eligible to get the Pfizer shot for the first time, like Pia Andrade, who lost her principal to COVID. I've seen the effects firsthand, and the more of us that get vaccinated, the better the world will be. Appointments also opening up at thousands of pharmacies across the country. We were with 14-year-old Julia Band getting her first dose. Why was it so important for you to get the shot? So I feel like we've been in this pandemic what feels like forever and I'm so ready to go back to my normal life. Her father, Dr. Kevin Ban, chief medical officer for Walgreens, says the pharmacy is also allowing walk-ins for kids and parents to make this as easy as possible. So what we want to do is make sure that they can get the shot easily, that it won't interrupt their life. And late today, the president saying Americans can actually start smiling at one another again. If you're fully vaccinated, and can take your mask off, you've earned the right to do something that Americans are known for all around the world, greeting others with a smile. <laughs> Our thanks to Wit for that. And now let's bring in former acting CDC director, Dr. Richard Bester and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Always good to have you on the show, Dr. B. The CDC director, as you know, essentially declared it's back to normal tonight for fully vaccinated Americans. 45% of Americans are fully vaccinated at this point. But are there specific situations like a supermarket, crowded bar, or coffee shop that you personally plan on still wearing a mask? You know, I, I don't think so. This to me marks a real turning point in, in this pandemic, and it's a recognition that we have incredibly effective vaccines. There's enough vaccines for, for everyone 12 and older who, who wants one. The number of cases occurring every day are, are, are going down. Um, and we're learning that it's, it's very unlikely that people who are vaccinated will spread the virus to, to other people, even if they happen to have, to have some of it in their nose. So with all of that, um, I see this as a, a brand new day. I'm, I'm excited to put away my mask, to go out and engage with friends and others uh, like I used to. Putting your mask away. But what about for public transit? Planes, trains, subways, that all applies? Well, you have to follow the local rules and regs, and I, I think for air travel, the, the rules are still uh, that you should be wearing a mask. What, what this does, though, it, it, it doesn't say the pandemic has gone away. It really puts the responsibility on the individual to get vaccinated or, or not. And if someone decides that they're not going to get vaccinated, the risk is primarily to that individual. The, the only other group that I would add in there really are, are young children. Uh, and so, you know, for for parents, young children who, who can't get vaccinated should be wearing masks in indoor settings like the, the, the current guidance says. But does this now make those young kids more vulnerable? Well, you know, it, 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 that, that's a, a, a good question. It depends what adults do. You know, if you have a, adults who are not getting vaccinated and you have a child who is wearing a mask who's around them, they get some protection from that mask, but it's not complete. Thankfully, the risk to younger children for severe disease is much, much lower. Uh, but you need to, to weigh that then as a, as a parent, what settings you want to put your, your child in. If the risk of severe disease was higher in young children, I don't think CDC would be making this change right now. I just want to circle back. Are you essentially pressing the reset button? Would your bottom line here be that, look, if you're fully vaccinated, you can return to almost every activity you did prior to the pandemic? Yeah, the, the only the only uh, caveat to that is if you're someone who has an underlying immune problem or some special circumstance that puts you at greater risk of either severe disease or of, of to not have uh, being being protected from the vaccine, talk to your doctor. But for for everyone else, this is a reset. This is a time where you can say, finally, I can get back to the life as I once knew it. Look, we've seen case numbers certainly at the lowest levels in more than a year, but at the same time, the virus is still spreading. Variants are still coming here. 55% of Americans are still not fully vaccinated. If you were the director of the CDC today, would you have made this move at this time? 
I would have. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that Dr. Walensky laid out a good case for why she made this this change at this point. Uh, there were a lot of people who said she should have been doing this a couple weeks ago, and there are a lot of people who were saying she should be waiting another few weeks before making this change. But I think the evidence is there. The, the important thing to remember, though, is that this is this is not a static situation. And if the case numbers in America start to go up significantly, uh, CDC will need to look at that information and consider whether additional changes need to be made. But given where we are right now, that we're getting into the warmer season, more outdoor activity, the numbers are going down, the the number of people in hospitals are, is, is going down, the number of people dying, thankfully, is going way, way down, I think it's the right time to make this change. You know, it, it seems like maybe this is an, an honor system uh, at this point. Are you concerned that unvaccinated Americans may now use this as essentially a license to go maskless and that we could actually see an uptick in cases as people ditch their masks, which we all know at this point are the most effective tool in our arsenal to prevent the spread of the virus? You know, I, I think that is truly possible. Uh, the thing about that is that the risk here uh, there's enough data to say that the risk here is primarily to those individuals who are deciding to not wear masks and not get vaccinated. Uh, I don't think that that's a smart risk to take. Uh, but if people are informed and that's the risk that they want to take, they're the ones who are going to mainly bear that, the burden of that. Any sense that you feel that we should have a national database of people who have been vaccinated? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that... Um, no, I, I think that the more we can do to encourage people to get vaccinated, to share why it's uh, it's a smart way to go in terms of what you can do and do safely, uh, I think that that's a, a better way to go here. Uh, you know, it's it's a, a database I think would further polarize our, our nation around this, and this has been the most polarized response to any public health crisis in my lifetime. And lastly, and I guess I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate here, but we did get word late yesterday that at least eight fully vaccinated Yankees tested positive for COVID. Is that cause for concern as these mask mandates are, are being lifted? Yeah, you know, I, I heard Dr. Walensky talk about that a little bit more. And, the, you know, those are being further investigated because uh, I think it was six of those eight had no symptoms whatsoever. And the, the amount of virus that was found was incredibly low. So I'll be looking to see further reports that, that, that come out of that. Uh, the, the key thing is, could those individuals then spread it to others? And it, it may be that that wasn't the case. Dr. Richard Besser, thank you so much as always for your time and your insight. It's always a pleasure, thank you. And now to the fallout from that pipeline hack. Colonial Pipeline tonight confirming that they have restarted their entire pipeline system. And according to sources, the company did pay a ransom to the hackers. Long lines at gas stations once again today. And Colonial Pipeline warning that it could take several more days to get things back to normal. And there's new action tonight to try to stop price gouging. Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, after days of long lines and empty pumps, a welcome sight for those desperate for gas. Lines of tanker trucks east of Raleigh filling up with fresh fuel from the Colonial Pipeline after the company restarted operations Wednesday. We expect the situation to begin to improve by the weekend and into early next week, and gasoline supply is coming back online. But there are still lines at the gas pump and hundreds of empty stations. People worried they might miss a doctor's appointment or not be able to get to work. I knew I should have filled up a week ago, and then all this starts going on, and it's like the toilet paper fiasco all over again. <laughs> so uh, this is at Durham. North Carolina, the hardest hit state so far from the shutdown. All of these people are waiting for the BP. North Carolina still hovering close to 70% without fuel. It will take several weeks to get things completely back to normal. Durham County telling their employees to work from home. Panic buying turning dangerous in Citrus County, Florida. One person was hurt after this Humvee caught fire. Fire crews found four five-gallon gas containers in the back. Today, we haven't seen the kind of panic buying we saw yesterday, but there are still issues. While this gas station has gas, take a look at this just across the street. Zeros on that sign, no gas. And with Memorial Day weekend coming up, time is of the essence to get all stations up and running. Though the Colonial Pipeline remains open, it may still be a headache, a chore to find gas stations with fuel for the next one to two weeks. 
not quite out of the woods just yet. Gio Benitez joins us now live from Atlanta. And Gio, you reported last night on some instances of price gouging in Virginia, for example, where there were reports of some $7 a gallon uh, for gasoline. Uh, and now you're hearing some of that is happening in Georgia. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. Right now, we've just learned that the attorney general here in Georgia is now investigating nearly 500 allegations related to price gouging. They are taking it very seriously, by the way, because they say that violators could face a $5,000 fine per incident, Lindsay. Per incident. Wow. Okay, Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. Israel is now calling up thousands of military reserves as the violence between Israelis and Palestinians continues to intensify. And tonight we're learning that there are Israeli troops on the ground in Gaza signaling an escalation in this conflict with thousands more amassing along the border. Matt Gutman has more. Tonight, the Israeli military sending ground troops into Gaza pounding alleged targets with artillery, fireballs from those airstrikes lighting up the night sky. Palestinian health officials saying at least 103 people have been killed since the fighting began, including over two dozen women and children, nearly 600 wounded. In Gaza, the Sabah family saying they got a call yesterday from the Israeli military informing them their neighborhood was about to be bombed and that they only had five minutes to leave their home. Civilians on both sides bearing the brunt. Eight Israelis killed by rocket fire so far, over 150 wounded. Hamas continuing to rain rockets on the Tel Aviv metro area, sending millions racing for cover, some freezing in fear. One of those rockets packed with a 100-pound warhead hitting this Tel Aviv suburb. That single rocket blast incinerated the cars below me, and just the shock waves themselves punched a hole through this apartment building. And everywhere you look, you can see shrapnel. But miraculously, nobody here was killed. Inside that building, residents climbing the smoke-blackened stairwell to pick through their belongings. And as we were reporting, as we are speaking, we hear uh, one of the, uh, the sirens going off. It's a code red. Um, everybody is about to run for cover, as we will. With sirens blaring, those residents scrambling out, some crying as they entered that shelter. You can hear those rockets uh, mounting right now. You can hear the booms all kind of squeezing into this uh, bomb shelter right now. The shelter stifling about 30 people inside, some of them unable to control the tears. So much fear there. Matt Gutman joins us now from all on the ground. What more are we learning about the Israel ground operations, Matt? Not a lot at this point, Lindsay. Um, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu put out a statement saying, in part, that the operation is meant to exact a, quote, very heavy price, end quote, um, from Hamas. He said it'll uh, take as long as they need to in order to provide, uh, quote, peace and security for the state of Israel. So no timeline. Uh, we also don't know what the actual objective is. Um, I don't think it is to entirely crush Hamas. That is simply not practical at this point? Um, is it to punish them to a certain degree that they will stop this rocket fire? Perhaps. Um, but I don't know how likely that is. I was told by an Israeli uh, military official today that um, Hamas still has many thousands of rockets in its arsenal. Um, Islamic Jihad also probably has uh, many hundreds of rockets. So it's unclear how this is going to play out. Um, incidentally, we are on our phone on the phone tonight with uh, our longtime producer and, and friend in Gaza, uh, Sammy, and as I was talking to him about something else that he had shot today, I could hear the artillery explosions through the phone. Uh, he said they were not far away. He was obviously not going to go out and check, but um, this is very much happening right now as we speak in Gaza. Um, many hundreds of thousands of people there, uh, of people there in, in a great deal of fear, um, because when you start firing artillery rather than those precision bombs, it starts getting much more deadly. There is more collateral damage. Even more civilians are killed. And that is obviously everybody's uh, primary concern, certainly in Gaza right now, Lindsay. Of course. And, and that also, last night you brought up tensions inside Israel and mixed Palestinian and Jewish communities. What's the latest there? You know, it's it's interesting. We've been standing here. It's uh, it's almost 2 a.m. and. Um 
we're watching cars go by filled with either um, uh, Israeli Arabs who might live in, in Jaffa behind me or uh, Israeli Jews kind of looking for trouble, asking who we are, what are we doing, and you see them roaming around. So tensions are very high still, uh, especially in several Arab Israeli towns, Lod in particular, essentially under martial law, um, essentially ethnic Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship um, are clashing with police, saying that they're tired of being treated like second-class citizens. Uh, they want the same funding uh, for their schools, for infrastructure. Um, they're also unhappy with the way that uh, they say that Israel has treated um, Palestinians in Gaza and the um, incidents in Jerusalem, particularly regarding the Temple Mount. So lots of tension brewing. Also today, Lindsay, there were three rockets fired from Lebanon, as if to remind Israel that there are multiple fronts here. So as we've been saying for the past couple days, I hate to repeat my Itself, but tensions remain extremely high and no end in sight for this. Lindsay. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you and stay safe once again. And for a personal perspective on this raging conflict, we're joined now by Palestinian rapper Tamar Nafar. He's also an actor, screenwriter, and social activist. Thank you so much for talking with us, especially under these really intense circumstances. Uh, we so appreciate your time. Uh, describe for us where you are, what's happening all around you. Hello, I'm staying right now at uh, the city of uh, Lid. I'm a Palestinian with uh, uh, Israeli identity. And is it peaceful where you are at this moment? Do you hear sirens, bombs? I'm hearing, uh, yeah, there's a lot of threats, but not by the sirens or the bombs. My threats are coming from the Israeli government or the settlers. And we're seeing lots of images of violence against Arab Israelis and clashes in the streets between Jews and Arabs. Explain for us all of the, the anger and the tension, even between people with the same citizenship. Yeah, same citizenship, it doesn't mean that it's the same uh, qualities. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's they, they both, that they both enjoy the same uh, democratic laws. Uh, ever since 1948, when, uh, when, when Israel uh, uh, kicked um, most of the Palestinians outside of the land, um, you know, a few of us stayed, and I'm the grandpair. I'm, I'm the grandson of one of those who stayed, and ever since, uh, we are not. Uh, we don't. We don't share the same rights as the Israeli Jews. So, this whole thing built up to what happened today, uh, to the rise up that we are witnessing today. So, before this latest round of attacks, what was it like for you to be uh, an Arab living inside of Israel, and why choose to rap about songs about the Palestinian experience? Here. We are Palestinians, so we are. I, I would appreciate more the definition of a Palestinian living inside of Israel. Uh, what was the situation before? The situation before is uh, not existing. Not existing when it comes to poverty, when it comes to housing, uh, when it comes to permits to build houses, when it comes uh, uh, um, um, to equal rights, when it comes to um, um, school education, everything. You know, we are being treated here as. Um, what is worse than a second-class uh, citizens? This is what we've been treating, and what we, we are seeing today is the result of what has been happening since 1948 until today. Uh, of course, there's finger pointing on both sides. What responsibility do you feel that Hamas bears for the deadly attacks that are happening right now? What an annoying question! It's like asking somebody. I mean. Why? Why is it when when every time a Palestinian guy comes and makes an interview, you want him to take a responsibility? Take a responsibility for what? I don't own an army. I don't own weapons. All I own as a rapper, as a musician, as an artist, is a microphone. And you are talking about a population that is armed. And you are talking about what are the responsibilities that we are holding? We hardly have any tools to deal with. Why, why, when it comes to Israelis and Palestinians, you always have to find uh, a way to justify the Israelis' crimes? Why? Oh, oh actually, no. I, I actually am not trying to justify either. I'm just trying to say, is there blame on both sides? Is there responsibility on both sides? Share it with me. I don't know what is my responsibility. Can you share it with me? What needs to happen at this point in order to stop the bloodshed in the streets? The world, first of all, in that exact moment, you can go even to my Instagram and you see a phone call that I did to the Israeli police. As, a, as an Israeli citizen, as, as a citizen of the most democratic uh, country in the Middle East, 
I called the cops and I was like, listen, I just got a message from you telling me that there's a care of you and you don't want me to go out in the streets, me as a citizen of this city. Uh, and at the same time, I'm watching the streets from my windows and I'm seeing a lot of uh, settlers coming from from uh, Hebron, from Khalil, coming from all over. They are coming here and they are equipped with short Uzis and with weapons. And they are just traveling around my streets. So you just said that I cannot travel. How come they, are, they can travel? And I have armed people being protected by the police. The police are protecting the armed people and not the unarmed people. So if you want me to ask what is the situation for me as a father right now, as somebody who's scared for his life, the only solution is that somebody, any organization, any UN, any police war, I don't, I don't know, Superman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, whatever you call, in this paranoia situation, what you ask what I'm expecting for, since the Israeli police is taking my money every year as a tax citizen and they are not protecting me, I'm asking for protection. Me and another 1.6 million Palestinians locked, in, held as hostages inside of Israel. That this is the first step that I'm asking for. Tamara Nafar, appreciate your time. Please stay safe. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. And when we come back, the active duty Marine charged with assaulting an officer during the January 6th insurrection as some Republicans continue to downplay it. The expected guilty plea of a former close associate of embattled Florida Congressman Matt Gates, but what does that mean for the investigation into Gates? But up next, whether it's passports or driver's licenses, there is a major backlog of critical documents that we need. What can we do about it? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Three people were hurt when, according to police, this small plane made an emergency landing on Interstate 355 in Illinois. The plane was in the air for about five minutes before the engine stalled. The passengers on board were treated for minor injuries, but as you can imagine, the landing did force the highway to shut down for a while. 
As more Americans get vaccinated and life starts to return to normal, there's a growing backlog of the appointments that many of us put off for the past year or more. Trips to the DMV, citizenship tests, but as our Andrew Dimbert reports, as those offices get up and running again, it may be harder to get an appointment and it might take you even longer once you get there. If you thought waiting in line or getting an appointment at the DMV was a hassle before the pandemic, now it's even worse. It is very challenging, actually, trying to get appointments scheduled. It's, you know, we're, it's about three months. From getting a learner's permit to a new license plate, for some processes, you just have to be there in person. Impossible during emergency COVID shutdowns. But as more states lift coronavirus restrictions and more Americans get vaccinated, services that couldn't go remote are opening back up, and DMVs are dealing with those delays. And look at this line of people. I mean, before you used to just walk in and they would have seats and you could sit down. Um, but now it's, you know, it's really different. Kathy here says her daughter has been waiting months to take her driver's test. Pre-pandemic, may have only taken a few days. It's frustrating. You, you know, you're studying, you want to you get the test done, you want to be able to get in there and do it. And, you know, you just can't. So many of these services are caught playing catch up. It could be a while before the log jam clears. In Virginia, the DMV says the department is seeing a surge with more transactions across all service channels now than pre pandemic. They're encouraging people to use online services, but it's not always possible. I'm here to get my uh, license, right? But um, it took me about three, four months to get the appointment. In Oregon, wait times might not clear for months. This driver says he's been trying to register and title four vehicles after moving to Oregon from out of state. If you call the DMV, they say that you have to wait 17 weeks before you can actually ask questions about where you're title information and stuff like that is. Back in Virginia, Leah Holtz was fortunate enough to update her plates, but it took patience Please. and a bit of luck. Um, yeah, I made a few phone calls to make sure I had all the right documents. Uh, I was able to get through like uh, probably beginning of April, but February or March um, could not get anybody on the phone line. <laughs> So now I'm um, here, I finally have everything I need. The COVID caused backups are also delaying a far weightier matter than a driver's license, the path to U.S. citizenship. Laura Munoz is an immigration advocate in Florida and says her phone is ringing off the hook with immigration statuses hanging in limbo. COVID delays have only created more anxiety and headaches for soon to be citizens wondering and waiting. Because if you don't hear back for a year and a half, two years, your green card might expire, you might have to put another $400 plus to renew that green card if you really need to, or you might go without a green card, which then you can, you know, it might have issues when you renew your license. For Laura, the backup is actually personal. Her very own naturalization was only just processed. Um, it has been a long wait, right? And even though I'm a part of this work, I have faced so many obstacles. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services tells ABC News naturalization ceremonies for new American citizens is a top priority, and some 110,000 citizenship applicants were suspended in the height of the pandemic because the naturalization process requires an in-person element. But the U.S. CIS says those applicants were able to naturalize in August of last year. And now that their offices have reopened under CDC guidelines, more citizenship services are catching up. Although there was a lot of advocacy for more components to, to go digital, it was uh, large in part mostly delayed until things have really started to reopen very slowly. Whether it's the DMV, citizenship, or anything in between that was suspended because of the coronavirus, now there's not much else Americans can do but be patient and persistent. I mean, it's fine. I've, I'm, I'm okay as long as I got my stuff. <laughs> Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. The patience and persistence always pays off. Our thanks to Andrew for that. Still ahead here on Prime, a major update in the cases against three officers who were part of George Floyd's arrest prior to his death. The group sending chocolates to Holocaust survivors, reminding them that they are remembered and helping them to cope with the isolation of social distancing. It's a beautiful story you won't want to miss. And you heard at the top of the show that major news about masks, so much going in the right direction, but the virus continues to claim lives. Where are the hot spots? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, President Biden on today's major CDC announcement.
Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to an ABC News analysis of COVID-19 vaccination and case data from all 50 U.S. states. Our experts found there does appear to be a correlation between a state's vaccination rate and its decline in new COVID infections. We take a look by the numbers. Connecticut, which has 44% of its total population fully vaccinated, saw a 60% drop in COVID cases in just four weeks after it expanded vaccinations to anyone over the age of 16. Similarly, Massachusetts saw 57% drop in cases after vaccinations were available to all adults. And Vermont, which leads the country in vaccinations per 100,000 residents, saw a nearly 61% drop in cases over four weeks. That's the largest percent decline of any state. States with lower vaccination rates saw more modest decreases in cases. In Mississippi, for example, where about 25% of residents are vaccinated, cases drop by 30% in a month. The White House hopes that 70% of U.S. adults will be inoculated with at least one shot by the 4th of July. To date, nearly 47% of the total U.S. population has had at least one dose, and more than 35% of Americans are now fully vaccinated. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. We all know what they did, but who are the hackers behind the pipeline sabotage that caused those fuel shortages? We take a closer look. Elon Musk says no thank you to Bitcoin when it comes to Tesla cars and the major impact that it caused to crypto markets. And McDonald's is raising their minimum pay dramatically. We'll explain why. But first, look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Scott, what's
almost the most hated man in America. You want to talk about the verdict first? Oh, wow, he's crazy. He's horrible. Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey. I think if people step back and look at the evidence in this case, they're going to see this crime isn't solved. Scott Peterson is where he deserves to be. There was information that I had that nobody knew or heard. Now, with his death penalty overturned, will he get another trial? I was the last one to see Lacey that day. 2020, Friday night on ABC. Missing teenager Kate Wallace was rescued today. Critics are raving. Jeanette Turner, you could have saved me and you didn't. Get her out of here! You stole my life because yours was pathetic. You were the only person who knew before anybody else came on this. I think this story is a little too scary. Oh, it's terrifying. Freeform's Cruel Summer, now streaming new episodes Wednesdays. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. To having adventures. To making mistakes. <gasps> to sleeping with the wrong people. And to unleashing holy hell. <laughs> Bold Type. Final season premieres May 26th on Freeform and next day on Hulu. Hey, the most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. guidance from the CDC saying in most cases people who are fully vaccinated can now safely go out without masks or social distancing including indoors and in crowds with exceptions for medical settings and travel. If you are fully vaccinated you can start doing the things that you had stopped doing because of the pandemic. We have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. It's a great milestone, a great day. It's been made possible by the extraordinary success we've had in vaccinating so many Americans so quickly. And more Americans are on their way to being vaccinated, with 12 to 15 year olds now able to get a shot in every state. You're about to get your first vaccine. For the first time, major pharmacies now offering shots to that age group after the CDC gave its recommendation saying the Pfizer vaccine was found to be 100% effective in 12 to 15 year olds with no safety concerns. We've been really eager to get them vaccinated as soon as possible. 13 year old Lucy Olson among the adolescents eagerly getting her first dose. It didn't hurt as much as I was expecting and it like went quicker and I haven't had any side effects. This expansion making 17 million more Americans eligible for the vaccine. A major step as case numbers drop along with many states restrictions. In Florida where all mandates have been lifted the governor announcing on Fox News he's pardoning anyone who violates violated mask or social distancing orders when they were in place. These things with health should be advisory. They should not be punitive. And so uh, we're happy to use our constitutional authority. Joel Greenberg, a close friend of Congressman Matt Gates, is scheduled to appear at a hearing Monday in Orlando, Florida. ABC News has learned Greenberg is expected to plead guilty in a criminal case connected to a federal sex trafficking investigation. That, according to court records and two sources with knowledge of the deal. The Florida congressman is also under investigation for allegedly having sex with a minor. Gates has vehemently denied having sex with an underage girl. In Minneapolis, the trial for the three other ex-police officers charged in connection with George Floyd's death has been delayed. Judge Peter Cahill announced the trial will be moved to March of 2022. The judge said he believed there needed to be some distance between the Derek Chauvin trial and sentencing and the trial of the other officers. Just a few weeks after Tesla said it would accept Bitcoin as payment for its cars, CEO Elon Musk is reversing that decision. Dow says he's concerned about the environmental impact of cryptocurrency. 
McDonald's deciding to increase its minimum wage in an effort to attract more employees. Company-owned restaurants will begin paying workers between $11 and $17 an hour, depending on the location. McDonald's hopes to hire 10,000 new employees in the next three months, Chipotle announcing a similar move earlier this week. Welcome back. We turn now to a new arrest for the January 6th attack on the Capitol. It's the first time an active duty officer has been charged in the insurrection, a Marine major. This comes as some Republicans are facing backlash tonight for claiming just this week that there was no attack. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Tonight, the first active duty military member charged in the January 6th insurrection. Prosecutors say the man seen here in the jacket and military backpack is Marine Corps Major Christopher Warnagiris, allegedly caught on camera breaking into the Capitol and helping other rioters force their way in. Warnagiris, who has spent nearly 20 years in the military, including multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, was arrested today in Virginia. Today, some Republican lawmakers find themselves under fire for denying the attack even happened. There was no insurrection, and to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bold-faced lie. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes taking videos and pictures. You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. I don't know on a normal day around here when people are threatening to hang the vice president of the United States or shoot the speaker. It was beyond denial. It fell into the range of sick. And tonight in a statement, the Marine Corps making it clear there is no place for racial hatred or extremism in its ranks. So far, more than 400 people have been charged in connection to the Capitol insurrection. That includes about 40 veterans. Lindsay. Rachel, thank you. Changing gears now, we all know what they did, but who are the people behind the criminal group that hacked that critical pipeline and caused so much havoc with this nation's fuel supplies? Trevor Alt brings us a closer look at the group Dark Side, the prime suspects in the attack, and their history of targets. Top government agencies urging anyone in charge of critical infrastructure to up their security because of Dark Side, a team of what experts tell us appears to be veteran digital extortionists responsible for shutting down the colonial pipeline. Dark Side is a criminal organization, um, almost cyber terrorists, if you will, and uh, what they look to do is to make money. They're coming for it. You're Sam Curry estimates half the companies his cybersecurity firm works with have fought off attempted ransomware attacks that Darkseid is known for, where hackers hold data hostage. It's like walking into a bank and locking the bank employees out of the vault and making them pay you to let them back in. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good analogy. Uh, and it's perfectly fair to say that data is the new currency in some ways. While this is a substantial criminal enterprise, Darkseid claims to have a code of ethics, saying they'll never attack places like hospitals, schools, or nonprofit organizations. And after the Colonial Pipeline attack, they even pledged to avoid social consequences in the future because, quote, our goal is to make money. They act like fake Robin Hoods. They claim to even make donations, but, but let's be honest, it's not like they're robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. Over the past year, ransomware attacks across the board have spiked 300 percent. And even if Darkseid only targets wealthy companies, cybersecurity officials fear other hackers may be more malicious. The potential is growing for more disruptive attacks as our infrastructure is increasingly digitized. If a hacker can get into the system to potentially create a disruptive uh, activity, um, possibly even catastrophic in, the, in terms of uh, loss loss of life or loss of the actual infrastructure. Lots of concern about the potential for calamity. And Trevor joins us now. Trevor, is it true that these criminals often gave access to these critical systems with the most benign, simple ways? It literally is, Lindsay. And make no mistake, these are very skilled cyber criminals. And the malware that they unleash on their victims is often very sophisticated and complex. But the way in very frequently is not. And we've all, re we've all received those spam phishing emails that seem a little bit off. They try to get you to click a link or maybe enter your information. People fall for those at a 
alarming rate, and it often only takes one person for a hacker like this to be able to gain access and do an excessive amount of damage. And that's why cybersecurity experts are stressing, you need to be extremely careful with your email of what you're clicking. You need to know what it is before you put in your information. If you're even a little bit suspicious, you need to forward that to your IT department. And if you think maybe you made a misstep, you clicked something you shouldn't have, you should change your password right away, which is also something you should be doing routinely regardless. And it sounds like these cybersecurity firms are also noticing some geographic trends as far as who Darkseid might attack and probably won't. Explain that for us. Well, obviously, with the, the giveaway being the United States and the Colonial Pipeline, a lot of their victims are English-speaking, but not always. Yesterday alone, Darkseid announced they'd hit three more companies, one in the U.S., one in Scotland, one in Brazil. What might be more interesting, according to these cybersecurity firms, is that they've noticed that Darkseid so far does not appear to have hit any companies that are in formerly Soviet countries, so Russia, Ukraine. Now, President Biden says, according to investigators, there is no evidence that Russia was directly involved, their government was directly involved in at least the Colonial Pipeline attack, but he says there is some evidence that these hackers might be based in Russia, and he says that that is something that, at the very least, he wants to speak to Russia's President Vladimir Putin about. Yeah, understandably so. Trevor Holt, good to have you in the studio. Good to see you. Thanks so much for talking with us. The pandemic for more than a year forced us all to keep our distance isolated and often stay away from the ones we love. It was jarring. But imagine being a Holocaust survivor, living through the fear of isolation or just plain old fear already once in your life and in your later years dealing with this. Kira Phillips brings us this beautiful story of two survivors and the chocolate company that never forgot. their past incredibly painful. I'm talking now and my whole body is shaking inside. I felt afraid every day and every night and every moment. Really is. Yes. Their perspective now. Take a look. Isn't that beautiful? Remarkably humbling. Freedom is a very, uh, a very special thing that you can only understand and appreciate when you didn't have it. I know how difficult life is. The Holocaust stole their youth. It's not just the isolation, it's the fear. We were afraid that the Nazis are coming, knocking on the door and take us away. This pandemic is stealing the only time they have left. It shook me. It didn't shake me of fear of dying, no. It shook me of taking away my time. Yes. It stole me. You are about to meet two Holocaust survivors separated by 4,000 miles who will teach us all. Somebody has to survive because the world has to know what happened. What it means to never give up. What did it feel like to be isolated in that barn as a little girl? I'm very emotional about that barn when I talk about the barn because I remember it clearly. First, we were in the in first three months, we were in a space of four feet by five feet, nine people. Hiding behind a secret wall within a rat-infested barn in Poland, fearing every day that the Nazis would find her. How did you stand up and stay still, nine of you, in a four by five space? You can do anything when you want, when you need to survive. Survival is a, is a skill, survival skills, they call it. A will to survive, 87-year-old Toby Levy says she's never lost and knew if she could survive the isolation of the Holocaust, she can survive COVID-19. If I meant to survive that virus, I will make it. And so far, I made it, and I want to keep it that way. So nestled in New York within this pandemic. It's tr tranquility, I call it. Toby teaches us how solitude can be a saving grace. While in Vienna, Austria, it's chocolate. Thank you very much. 92-year-old <laughs> Lucia Alman has been living through COVID isolation too. A stark reminder of the four years she hid from the Nazis deep in the cellar of this old factory owned by a craftsman who refused to let her die. It was not only taking from your life the hope that it, uh, it would end. 
was a minimum. So now this retired doctor knows what small surprises can do for the soul. Joseph, you can see what I got. Like the joy of a box of chocolates. You know I like sweet things. To sweeten her solitude of quarantine. The nonprofit Centropa delivering free chocolates and books. Packages of hope to remind Holocaust survivors like Lucia in Austria and Toby in America that even behind closed COVID doors, they are not alone in this pandemic. We feel that uh, not forgetting these people is the best thing that we can do and to let them know that they're never going to be forgotten. So while Toby awaits her Centropa care package, I want to sweat it to a lot of Zoom, so don't worry about it. We help deliver a different type of sweet treat. Are you ready to meet Toby? Yes, please. A moment. I'm here, I'm here. So I'm sweeter okay. than chocolate. Nice to meet you. Likewise. We would be good, a good couple. We as would be, yes. Two miracles meeting for the first time. So how many years were you in hiding? Four years, four years, wow. We had the, the great luck, yes. like a, a mystery. Uh, no, a miracle, I call it a, a miracle. miracle. Connected by COVID. How did you feel when the pandemic started? I feel terrible. I am a doctor, so I know what it means, an epidemic. And courage. There had been so many years, no light for the future. Reminding all of us. But it's okay now. There is a light opening, yes. Yes. It's the true survivors. You were married to a Jewish, bo Jewish man? I was 17 and he was 26. Oh, wow. And we fall in love and we had been the whole life I was with him. That have the strongest souls. So you had a good life, thank God. No complaints. No complaint, no. <laughs> so for families right now who are watching this interview and they are feeling fear in this pandemic, what do you say to them? You have to have hope one day at a time. That's what my father used to say, one day at a time. Have to have hope. What a sweet story. Our thanks to Kira for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. A smile, a hug, and a handshake. It's the little things that mean so much and are now possible for those who are fully vaccinated. This moment today between President Biden and Vice President Harris came just after President Biden spoke about the new guidelines from the CDC for fully vaccinated Americans. Biden saying we can now greet each other with a smile, calling it a good day for our country. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including that major news from the CDC on masks. But we're also continuing to track the latest on that pipeline sabotage. But Ginger Z has more on why advocates say the fuel shortages we saw are proof that we should move to a renewable energy world. And as more people get vaccinated and employers ask for their employees to return to the office, so many are dealing with some anxiety over returning to work. We speak to an expert for some advice. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. We move up to the vehicle, he detonates the bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation, the takedown of the bomber, now streaming on Hulu. 
Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Scott, what's the most hated man in America? You want to talk about the verdict first? Oh, it was crazy. Horrible. Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey. I think if people step back and look at the evidence in this case, they're going to see this crime isn't solved. Scott Peterson is where he deserves to be. There was information that I had that nobody knew or heard. Now, with his death penalty overturned, will he get another trial? I was the last one to see Lacey that day. 2020, Friday night on ABC. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. We're learning tonight from sources that Colonial Pipeline did, in fact, pay a ransom to the hackers who tried to sabotage their pipeline. More on that in a moment. This is that critical pipeline is now restoring operations. Those long gas lines could last up to two weeks in certain places. For the first time, an active duty officer has been charged for involvement in the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Prosecutors say Marine Corps Major Christopher Warnagiris was caught on camera breaking into the building and helping other rioters in. He has served multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was arrested in Virginia. And the trial for the three former police officers charged in connection with the death of George Floyd has been postponed until next March. Judge Peter Cahill now says that he wants to put some distance between their trial and Derek Chauvin's, who will be sentenced next month. Cahill also said that he wants to let the federal civil rights case against all four of them play out. There have been several major developments tonight in the fight against COVID. First, today is the first day that 12 to 15-year-olds are eligible to get their Pfizer vaccine. But today, of course, the CDC made major news when they released new guidance for vaccinated Americans. Marcy Gonzalez reports in, from L.A. with the latest. Pivotal new guidance from the CDC saying in most cases, people who are fully vaccinated can now safely go out without masks or social distancing, including indoors and in crowds, with exceptions for medical settings and travel. If you are fully vaccinated, you can start doing the things that you had stopped doing because of the pandemic. We have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. It's a great milestone, a great day. It's been made possible by the extraordinary success we've had in vaccinating so many Americans so quickly. And more Americans are on their way to being vaccinated, with 12 to 15-year-olds now able to get a shot in every state. You're about to get your first vaccine. For the first time, major pharmacies now offering shots to that age group after the CDC gave its recommendation saying the Pfizer vaccine was found to be 100% effective in 12 to 15-year-olds with no safety concerns. We've been really eager to get them vaccinated as soon as possible. 13 year old Lucy Olson among the adolescents eagerly getting her first dose. It didn't hurt as much as I was expecting and it like went quicker and I haven't had any side effects. This expansion making 17 million more Americans eligible for the vaccine. A major step as case numbers drop along with many states restrictions. In Florida, where all mandates have been lifted, the governor announcing on Fox News he's pardoning anyone who violated mask or social distancing orders when they were in place. These things with health should be advisory. They should not be punitive. And so uh, we're happy to use our constitutional authority. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Our thanks to Marcy for that. And now to the push for a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Tonight, the White House is optimistic that a deal could be in sight. Our Mary Alice Parks reports. Hello, folks. 
President Biden doubling down on his calls for major infrastructure spending, arguing the recent cyber attack on a major American oil and gas pipeline is another reason for a large investment. This event is providing an urgent reminder of why we need to harden our infrastructure. At a meeting later with members of his cabinet and Republican senators, Biden sounding hopeful that a bipartisan deal can be reached. I know they're sincere about it and so am I. And what we're going to try to do is figure out what we can uh, agree it constitutes infrastructure from each of our perspectives. The president also met yesterday with top leaders from both parties to keep negotiating his proposals. But there are still major disagreements about how to pay for it all. Democrats saying it's time to harden laws to make it tougher for some people and corporations to evade paying taxes and to revisit some of the tax cuts to corporations put in place by former President Trump. Republicans so far rejecting the idea of rolling back the clock. We're not interested in reopening the 2017 tax bill. We both made that clear to the president. That's our red line. And there's still a debate about what counts as infrastructure. Republicans far more eager to work on fixing roads and bridges than funding additional housing or care for seniors, as the president has also proposed. West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin, who's been leery of the scope of the president's proposals, telling ABC he, too, is seeing progress in the bipartisan talks. I don't know what a top line may be, but that's a tremendous movement from where the people have assumed they would be. And if we can address the needs of of our country. In this debate, President Biden has made clear he's not that interested in putting in place many user fees for roads or bridges. His argument is that would put too much of the cost back on working Americans. Lindsay. And for more on cyber threats, we bring in ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, it's reported that Colonial Pipeline went ahead and paid that ransom over the hack. What have you learned about that? Lindsay, we're still sorting out how the ransom might have been paid. These ransomware attacks are complicated and can sometimes involve third parties. But I've been told by sources that the ransom demanded was in the low millions of dollars and that attack launched by a gang using ransomware developed by Darkside, a group of hackers based in Russia. Lindsay, this is a stunning reminder of how vulnerable U.S. companies are to such hacks and the limitations of the federal government in controlling how companies maintain their security and respond to these kind of attacks. We know the FBI's position was that the ransom should not be paid, Lindsay. Uh, and we've heard from the experts, though, that companies quite often do pay these ransoms, which, of course, makes this crime profitable and attractive to bad actors. What do U.S. officials say about that? And is there anything that they can do to stop companies and individuals from making these payments? Lindsay, we found out that in the past year, U.S. companies and consumers have paid ransoms in the amount of about $350 million. So this is an ongoing and very lively and clearly profitable uh, thing for criminals to do. Now, again, the FBI is saying you shouldn't pay this. I talked to a Secret Service source today who said they always tell companies not to pay uh, the ransoms, but clearly these companies are under pressure. And to be honest with you, there's not a lot that the federal government can do because these are private entities and they control how they respond. And you talked about how profitable this is, according to DHS, ransomware is also now the fastest growing cyber crime. And we've heard from experts that it's a relatively cheap crime to pull off. So what can the government do to fight it? Well, again, this software was developed by this group, Darkside, and apparently they dole it out to whoever wants to use it. And then when it's used, the people that do the extortion pay them a cut of what they make. Now, you're right. This is a very fast-rising type of crime. Uh, the Homeland Security officials reported in the last week or so that they've seen a nearly 300 percent jump in ransomware cases in the past year, Lindsay. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Tonight, clean energy advocates say that the pipeline hack is proof that it's time to accelerate the push to end our reliance on fossil fuels and go green. Our Ginger Z has this week's It's Not Too Late. Hi, I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. Now, I know you've seen the panic. It's literally survival of the fittest right now. Do you have gas? And they said, no, oh, it's 
all out, nothing we can do. My gas tank is basically empty and all the gas pumps has out of service. The challenged gas stations. Yeah, this gas station just got a delivery overnight and they're already running out. Only regular is left here. Across the street, there is no gas at all. And it's all thanks to... The Federal Bureau of Investigation has determined Colonial's network was infected by ransomware. And it's a criminal act, obviously. The Colonial Pipeline. Yes, that's the pipeline that's been dominating the news this week. The one that services a huge chunk of the southeastern United States and caused gas shortages in more than a dozen states. And you know, as soon as this happened, my mind went to this. But before EV owners get all high and mighty, I think the bigger question is, are we relying too much on one type of energy or one type of fuel? Would more renewable energy help us in a situation like this, or would it make us more susceptible? Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm says that they are still committed to the zero emissions by 2035. It's a big change in the grid, and they know they're going to have to put in new protections. You know, if you drive an electric car, this would not be affecting you, clearly. It's an issue for the president's uh, priority in the American Jobs Plan, the issue of investing in a transmission grid, for example, so that you don't have the cyber issues associated with it. So there's a lot of broader questions in this. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to see that investment in infrastructure that will facilitate clean and renewable energy. And I know you have not forgotten the Texas winter storm debacle. And yes, while the turbines did freeze, so did the natural gas and the nuclear and the coal. Everything froze. So that wasn't an attack by a person or a group. That was attacked by Mother Nature. This is part of what we have in mind when we talk about resilience. Uh, we need to make sure our infrastructure is resilient to climate security issues caused by the increased frequency and severity of weather events. But we also need to be sure uh, that we are resilient in the face of cyber threats. Okay, so Randy, let's start with the obvious that right when we heard this, my mind went to, what about renewables? Wouldn't this be a great moment to say, shouldn't we diversify our energy? Well, we should diversify our energy and move to a clean energy economy regardless of what happened with the Colonial Pipeline. Um, but actually, renewables are just as vulnerable. Um, any, any infrastructure that is connected to the internet, which frankly is more and more infrastructure every day, is vulnerable to some, to some type of cyber incident. But energy experts tell us that renewable energy is distributed among more smaller systems than fossil fuels. That means that there are more targets for hackers, but also less of a potential impact if one system is compromised. As you put more distributed, again, more distributed resources onto this electricity system, you do open yourself up to more vulnerabilities. So part of the energy transition needs to be thinking about resilience writ large and cyber resilience in particular. Oh, okay. So this is vulnerable too. I don't think it's one or the other. I, I actually think it's both. That there, there is going to be oil and gas in the energy system for a very, very long time, and they're going to be economically important. We're going to rely on them. And so we should build resilience into the oil and gas infrastructure. President Biden has signed an order to improve the government response to cyber attacks. And the White House says that funding from the infrastructure bill that they're talking so much about could also be used to shore up protections. And perhaps this serves as a warning because we haven't made that new renewable grid. So this will get us in a better position to make it more protected. I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. A warning for many reasons, our thanks to Ginger still to come. From groceries to travel, why does everything seem to be so much more expensive? And what, if anything, can we do about it? And the remarkable story of one athlete who is now inspiring so many 13 months after an attempt on his own life. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. New concerns about the upcoming Tokyo Olympics. The United States track and field team canceled its pre-Olympics training camp in Japan over safety concerns amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Japan is battling a surge in coronavirus infections. Many in that country want the games canceled or postponed for yet a second time. Opening ceremonies are scheduled to begin July 23rd. Russian President Vladimir Putin says that school shooting from earlier in the week has, quote, shaken the country. The tragedy already has lawmakers looking to revise school security protocols and tighten control over civilian gun ownership. Nine people, seven students and two school employees were killed when a 19-year-old opened fire. Millions of Muslims across the world are celebrating Eid, which marks the end of Ramadan. Many of them forced to do it much more quietly due to COVID restrictions, but we wish all observing a happy Eid. And as we said in the last hour, we're now learning that Israel is amassing troops along the Gaza border, and we're just getting new satellite images of the devastation there in Gaza and southern Israel. The toll of days of explosions on both sides. Matt Gutman, what more can you share? Lindsay, the Israeli military telling us that they have launched what they are calling a ground incursion into Gaza. What that actually means, though, is that they have positioned tanks and artillery. That's the first time in this latest outbreak of violence that they have done so, firing that into the Gaza Strip. Um, of course, when we are talking about uh, artillery and tank fire, it is much less accurate than those precision-guided missiles that they've been using against Hamas targets so far. In addition to that, Israel says that it has called up about 7,000 reservists. They're deploying them towards the southern border. They're not going in at this point. Um, we don't know if they're going to launch an actual invasion of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, earlier released a statement saying that this incursion is meant to uh, force Hamas to, quote, pay a heavy price, end quote. He said that there's no real timeline at this point. However, uh, their goal, as vague as it is, is to um, create peace and security for the state of Israel. So we don't know how long they're going to uh, continue this uh, artillery and tank fire. We don't know if they're actually going to send troops in. Uh, we don't know if they want to, um, you know, destroy Hamas or just reduce their capabilities. Uh, 
We also don't know how much politics is involved in all of this, uh, an effort to try to assure Israelis by the prime minister, who is in a very precarious political state, that he's doing everything he can to protect them. Now, as they did launch that ground incursion, as they call it, which tank and artillery fire, um, they told residents around Gaza within basically a 30 kilometers, so like a 16, 17 mile radius, to uh, get into their bomb shelters. Um, they are expecting reprisals. That as uh, Hamas has launched at, at this point over 1,700 rockets into Israel, uh, eight Israelis killed, over 150 wounded. On the Palestinian side, obviously the death toll much more significant. Well over 100 people killed so far. Um, we are told by Palestinian health officials that um, there are over two dozen women and children who've been killed, uh, well over 600 people wounded. Um, again, unfortunately, there is no end in sight. The U.S. Um, is sending one of its top envoys to the region. Egypt has a person in Gaza right Right now, um, but again, it doesn't seem like this is actually slowing down, and it seems like it's accelerating at this point. One thing that we can note is that we have not heard that uh, Red Dawn siren, those air raid sirens, for many hours today. Uh, we don't know what that means. We just know that at least here in the center of Israel, where we are right now in Tel Aviv, uh, that there hasn't been uh, rocket fire in multiple hours. Uh, perhaps that's good news unclear at this point. It is important to note that um, an Israeli official with whom I spoke earlier said that they still believe that Hamas has thousands of rockets, so it's not like they've um, fired themselves out of rockets by this point. They still have an arsenal, unclear how they uh, intend to deploy it at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, not clear where this is going, but certainly right now we can say it's not over yet. Lindsay. And you use the word accelerating. Lots of concern behind that. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. Next to the sticker shock that we've been reporting on for weeks, and it continues to persist. Prices continue to rise from everything from groceries to travel. Why is this happening and what can we do about it? Rebecca Jarvis has more. Consumers across the country paying more at checkout as inflation grows. Food prices have increased exponentially, seafood rising almost 20 percent. Fruit and baked goods like donuts and rolls will cost nearly 8 percent more, and meats like beef and pork price nearly 5 percent higher. And it's not just food prices that are increasing. The price of diapers and toilet paper expected to rise later this summer. The cost of lumber up 250 percent. Even your summer vacation could be more expensive. Flights up 7 percent. And if you can find a rental, be prepared to pay hundreds more. What's happening is basically a supply demand issue. There's just not enough supply to meet demand. And that's all over the board. The price increases linked to disruptions in the supply chain caused by the pandemic and severe weather, but also an increase in money in the economy through stimulus checks and tax returns. The more money that you have, the more people have as far as being able to spend. And so it's just causing this, this ripple effect within the economy. And that may be the case for a while. On Wednesday, the government reported that last month, consumer prices overall surged by more than 4%, the fastest rise since 2008. <laughs> There are ways to ease the pain in the checkout aisle. Apps like Basket let users price check items between different stores so you can be sure you're getting the best deals. Other apps like Ibotta and Checkout 51 provide cash back and coupons for gas, groceries and prescriptions. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis. With so many emotionally jarring events occurring over the past year, many Americans are struggling with their mental health. And now, as our country starts to return to normal, there's a lot of stress that comes with going back to work and now ditching masks, which many have become so used to. Dr. Janet Taylor, a psychiatrist and an expert on the emotional and economic impact of mental illness, as well as the former host of Discovery Health and own series Facing Trauma, joins us now. Welcome to the show, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. So what's your advice for someone who is fully vaccinated but maybe doesn't feel so comfortable without their mask just yet? Is it best to just go cold turkey, so to speak, and, and start going without it? Or do you feel it's more of a, a slow burn, a slow process? 
Well, as you mentioned, so many of us have had stress for the past 14 or 15 months anyway. There really is no point in doing something that creates more anxiety or stress. If you've been fully vaccinated, I think you should let people know in, your, in where you are, whether that's in your office or around, so that will ease their own discomfort and certainly pay attention to whatever makes you feel more comfortable. Just because we can certainly wear a mask, uh, as, as Dr. Fauci said, safely um, doesn't mean that you don't you, you don't have to wear it if it makes you feel comfortable. So do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Use common sense. Notice when you are feeling anxious and be aware of those triggers and then do an action that brings you some peace. And, and what about the dynamics of not knowing if a stranger or coworker that's close to you, um, if, whether they've been vaccinated or not, and suddenly everyone isn't wearing masks? So how do you deal with droplet anxiety? Well, I think you still have to think, you know, just as you don't talk about politics, you know, at the dinner table or, or, or other places, I think it's, it's touchy whether you ask someone if they have been vaccinated. That's why I think if you have been, volunteer it and say it. But just use common sense. If, if you really know that the unknown, the uncertainty makes it worse, wear a mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing. You don't have to change all that just because you can, knowing that our brain likes certainty. And in times of uncertainty, our brain will take us on this roller coaster ride to the worst possible outcome, which creates more angst. So if it makes you feel better not knowing to protect yourself with a mask or wash your hands or practice social distancing, do that. So I've been going about this wrong then, Dr. Taylor, because I ask people, I mean, no judgment. I just want to know. I'm just, I'm just curious. Inquiring minds want to know. Many Americans will, of course, be gearing up, though, to go back to work in the coming months, and, and many are already making the transition. After a year at home, what do you think some of the challenges are that might arise as, as we return to a, a quote-unquote normal work environment? Well, working through stress is a huge challenge. And then also, at the same time, worrying about your children or extended family members. But if you're going back to a structured work environment, talk to HR. Talk to them about the policies that they have, and, and most have them. And then just be determined to know whatever you need to do to alleviate your anxiety. Have plenty of masks, you know, bring your own lunch. And, and most importantly, I think, is to still exercise, get a good night's sleep, practice all those positive coping mechanisms. So many people feel like just because it's 2021, things have changed and we have lifted this veil of anxiety. We haven't, and in some cases have more. So this is really a time to work on whatever makes you feel better, you know, know the guidelines, find out information, and then proceed as you can, and then review the day, what worked, what didn't, and then be determined to do more of what worked for you that made you feel more relaxed. And as parents go back to work, children, of course, are also returning to school after they've spent the past year adjusting to this new normal. What would you recommend parents do in order to help their children readjust to social activity? Well, to help your kids readjust to social activity, certainly pay attention. Ask them what ifs. Our kids notice, too, when people don't have masks, and that causes them a lot of anxiety. Teach them ways to certainly, you know, wash their hands, do all those things, and check in with them on a regular basis, especially as they're making that transition back to school, just asking how did things go, is there anything that happened that made you feel uncomfortable, and really paying attention to their well-being, looking for patterns in sleep that may just be disrupted, how they play, how they interact with you, because our kids are really feeling a lot of the brunt of the angst that we have and don't necessarily have the tools to voice it. Some helpful guidance there. Dr. Janet Taylor, thank you so much. My pleasure. And finally tonight, the rising baseball star. He was at his lowest point in life just over a year ago. And now he's reaching new heights and sharing his inspirational story. Will Gans has more. They say that hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in all of professional sports. In the second inning of a minor league game between Sacramento and Las Vegas on Tuesday, Drew Robinson crushing the ball into the bullpen. A home run, pretty amazing. Even more so when you consider that only 13 months ago, the 29-year-old pro ball player attempted suicide. How can this be happening? What happened? Are we trying to survive this? Now, Robinson's comeback already being called the most inspirational sports story of the year. It's the subject of a documentary airing tonight on ESPN. I thought that I had to live up to this impossible level of perfection. Robinson played in 100 MLB games for both the Texas Rangers and the St. Louis Cardinals from 2017 to 2019. I just remember the feeling of being on top of the world. 
How long did it last? Until the next day when I got sent down. In April of 2020, Robinson attempting to take his own life with a revolver, but he survived. The incident would cost him his right eye, but he says it allowed him to find his focus, ending the stigma around mental health issues. Everyone wants to get better and to feel better and get out of the darkness. I just want people to know it's okay to talk about it and to reach out for help and to feel safe when they do so. The right fielder sharing that message with his teammates. As he works his way from the minor leagues back into the majors, Robinson continuing to improve his mental health while embracing his own miraculous physical recovery. He got so lucky, he's still alive. I'm supposed to help people get through something that they don't think is winnable. What a comeback and our thanks to Will for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.